Hello everyone, this is Braden Kelly of bloggingInnovation.com here with Eric Liu, author of the, the, the new book, Imagination First, leading back to that, that you can incent innovation. And if so, how do you think you could? Well, um, I know you've had uh, my friend Dan Pink um, you know, uh, on these interviews before, and he, his, his most recent book is Drive, mm -hmm. all about motivation, right? And the work of Carol Dweck, the great uh, psychologist at Columbia University. All this work teaches us that there's a profound difference between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, right? Um, and so is it possible to incent imagination by telling people, hey, you know, if you are more imaginative, you'll get more of a bonus or you'll get this, you know, uh, salary bump or whatever. Sure, of course, right? But I think in doing so from an organizational standpoint, you have to be very careful about making sure you keep on tapping the intrinsic motivation of the person who's trying to come up with new ideas. Their intrinsic motivation is about being effective at what they do or expressing some creative impulse or exploring a way to connect dots in ways that haven't been connected that's just personally satisfying. Right. We've got to incent that, the kind of feeding of that intrinsic motivation. Um, I'm a big believer in putting challenge awards out there, right? The X Prize or something like that. And, and X Prize kind of imitators across all these different sectors um, put a big pot of gold out there and, and, and a big audacious goal and say, first team to come up with X, right? Suborbital manned space flight or uh, a cost efficient electric car or, um, you know, a, a really good assistive technology for the blind, whatever it may be. You know, having a goal like that and having a, an ins a, a monetary incentive can indeed spur imagination, creativity, and innovation. Um, but it's got to be all about first some interior impulse in the first place to do good and to achieve that purpose. Right. And Dan talks a lot about that, and I, I think it is very important. Just wanted to get your perspective on it, and I think you gave a very good one there. Um, moving on to the, the fifth question, can organizations become more innovative? Oh, absolutely. Organizations n not only can, they must. Um, one, of th one of the mythologies that we all succumb to when we think about large organizational life is we think of organizations as fixed, as fixed entities. But every organization is simply an ecosystem. It's simply a complex adaptive system, right? And the nature of complex adaptive systems is adaptation, right? right? Continuous adaptation. And some of it is controlled from the top, but most of it is happening organically, right? And that's true of every ecosystem you're talking about, whether you're talking about a garden um, or a neighborhood where there might or might not be crime um, or an organization that used to be strong and maybe is now falling on harder times. Um, and so I think whether you're a leader of that organization or a team member in that organization, it's all about attending to what is the health of the system, right? What are the way, what are the parts of the system that feel dead, that feel no longer open to new ideas and new possibilities, and really trying to prune or trying to reinvigorate with new uh, ideas and new leadership um, that part of the organization. It's totally possible for even a very stuck organization to get unstuck. Um, but I think it has to happen not because of some heroic CEO or charismatic leader. It has to happen in an incredibly distributed way where, I mean, this is what complex adaptive systems theory teaches you, right? Um, it's all about at, every, at, the, at the cellular level, right? This is the success of Al-Qaeda, quite right. honestly, right? right. Al-Qaeda succeeds not because of Osama bin Laden, though he is this kind of galvanizing, charismatic face of that network. It, it succeeds to the extent it does because people in distributed ways all across the network of terror that they've built know what the operating system is, know what the goals are, have freedom to develop and innovate new ways to actually execute their goals, and they go about and do it. And um, it's a very viral, horrific thing. Um, but if we think again, again, if we flip our imaginations and think about how can we take those kinds of lessons about how an organization behaves like a network, like a living system, um, and then infuse good purposes rather than hateful, destructive purposes, right. um, then we get an insight into how organizations can continuously adapt. Well, and I think that's very important as people start thinking about how to have more innovative organizations is to, to have 
more human or more biological type organizations that can continue to adapt and, and learn. And it leads us well into our, our final question, which I love to ask every chance I get, which is uh, if you were able to change one thing about the educational system to create tomorrow's innovators, uh, what would that be? Wow. Well, this is not a theoretical question for me because I'm very involved in public education in Washington State and in Seattle. Um, and one thing, I think I would want to make as much of the schooling process as possible project-based learning and everything that goes with it, right? So project-based learning, which is just learning by doing, right? Learning your math or your social studies or your science by creating a project. And that project can be, um, you know, an environmental impact study, or that project can be a petition to the governor, or that project can be repairing a car, or that project can be building a robot. Whatever that project is, um, it's some concrete, practical, meaningful way um, for learners to apply everything they're learning and for teachers to feel motivated to feed that learning into real life applications, right? Um, so much of our education system gets drained of its creativity because you have a lot of kind of facts detached from purposes, um, knowledge detached from motivation, again, right? Um, and, and, uh, and the relevance that a, that a kid needs to feel in school about why does it matter that I, whether I learn Algebra 1 or Algebra 2, right? right? Well, it matters because no matter what you want to do, um, it's going to come into play. And I'm not just going to say that. I'm going to show you it by having you do this thing, by having you build this space or create this project. And, um, and so to me, that is, it's not the silver bullet, but it is one thing I would want to do to really stimulate a lot more. You know, the thing that we have to have in public education is a lot more emphasis on what if um, and not just on what is, right. right? Of course, facts and fundamentals matter. And there's a sequence um, in which you need to make sure that uh, learners are grounded in the basics. Um, it's hard to do a project-based way um, just to get kids to master the multiplication tables. There's use in just mastering the times tables, you know, so you got that down and you own it and you internalize it. But having right. mastered those, same with the alphabet, having mastered those basics though, what you do with them is all about trying to find, um, again, engaged, um, relevant ways to unlock people's uh, imagination and make uh, opportunities for people to ask always, what if? So more integrated ways to make things real for kids and to help unlock their imaginations. Yeah, and that is, you can find that in every way. I mean, there's so much exciting stuff happening now at the, at the intersection of career and technical education and high technology, or at the intersection of, you know, interdisciplinary work that combines, for instance, environmental studies and sustainability with what we think of as civics and social studies. I mean, it's just about breaking down boundaries. Project-based learning inherently, just like project, projects at work, Right? When you're doing a project at work, I don't care where you work, you, you don't think about this as, well, here's the social studies part of the project I'm doing. Here's the math part of the project I'm doing. Here's the English part of the project I'm doing. You're just doing a project. You and your team are doing a project, right? Uh, and the more we can teach kids in that way, uh, the better prepared they will be for success after school. Definitely. So this has been Braden Kelly with bloggingInnovation.com and Eric Liu of Imagination First.